Joe to Prof. Sarah and all that sort of shit. Uh, but as I remember him, he was a person who had invited the ire of many of us uh, way back in uh, uh, 92, 93, 94, when he, along with our own Siddharth Ramji, started on the project of oxygenating, uh, resuscitating infants without oxygen. And uh, all of us, I too remember, I was also there as a young neonatologist fighting and asking it's unethical for not using oxygen these trials were being done in developing countries because it could not be done abroad and so on and so forth. And uh, for a better say of words, I could say we all have egg on our face today. And reluctantly, we have to accept that one of the pioneering works in resuscitation has <coughs> been there. And we're very proud to say that Dr. Ramji could today, in my eyes, uh, be considered as one of the pioneering researchers who has really contributed for changes in uh, the way we handle newborn babies. Uh, we have Professor Ola. Welcome, sir. I don't think you need too much introduction. And Thank you. I presume uh, you will bear with me when I said that the initial studies that you did with uh, Siddharth Ramji did attract a lot of criticism by many of us who were the youngsters in the crowd. And today we look back at you as a person who showed us that there's a lot more to neonatology than what we think we know. <coughs> so I cannot think of a better person to lead us into a very familiar world world of delivery room care. I won't take much time. Over to Professor Ola. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, I just uh, have to get the slide mode. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Do you see my slides? And do you hear me? Uh, uh, doctor, uh, we can see your uh, too many slides, you know, not the PowerPoint uh, slideshow. Uh huh. Because I see that. No, no. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yeah. And then just stop sharing. And can you go to Zoom now? Can you do you see Zoom? And go to yeah. sharing again, and you will see a full screen of that slide. Yeah, full, there full, it is. Uh, please share that. Yeah. Um, there. Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Thank now you. it is. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Okay. So thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm so sorry I I'm not uh, present. Physically in Kerala, I always wanted to go to Kerala. I never been there. I've been to India many times, as the chairman mentioned. Uh, my first visit was in um, early '90s, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's correct what you said that uh, the study uh, Siddharth Ramji and I uh, conducted um, in uh, published in 1993 was really a pioneer work, and. <clears throat> Many people were really angry about my idea about uh, using air and said it was unethical. Um, so, uh, but of course, it is very satisfactory to see that today it is accepted all over the world that term and near term babies should be resuscitated uh, initially with air. Well, this is not the topic of my lecture today. I will talk about delivery room handling of the newborn. And now I see if I can change slides. Yeah, here it is. Here are my disclosures. Um, and um, I also have an outline. It's very ambitious. And I, I don't have time to go into details of all these um, topics, issues during 30 minutes. Uh, but I will I'll talk about. Uh, uh, for instance, there is a very recent European survey about delivery room handling. I've shared some of these data with you. Um, and I'm not talking very much about oxygenation. Uh, I will go, get, go beyond a little bit, beyond the delivery room. And I also talk about hyperthermia therapy. I would like to discuss the Helix trial with you. And I'm very interested to hear your opinion about this trial. So this is um, the ILCOR. I just have to re 
organized so I can see my slides completely. Yeah. So this is the ILCOR algorithm for newborn vegetation published in 2010. And at this stage, they introduced the term, the golden minute. It was actually Max Venter who a year earlier had introduced this term. And this means that within the first minute of life, um, every newborn should be taking its first breath. And if it doesn't breathe, it should be helped uh, by uh, positive pressure ventilation. However, the ILCO did one mistake in my opinion, and they never defined when the golden minute starts. And I talked about this several times before. And when you look into the literature, you see different definitions. Uh, so mentioned here when the shoulders are out, when the cord is cut, when the baby is on the recitation table. But I think today we all agree that we should start the clock when the whole baby is out. And I think this is important because we're talking about the golden minute and we talk about one minute APCA score. We have to know what we mean by that. So what are you supposed to do during this golden <clears throat> minute? Well, the first 30 seconds, you should dry the baby, keep it warm, wrap it in plastic if it's immature, stimulate it to breathe if it doesn't breathe by itself and position the airways correctly. And you should start to monitor heart rate and breathing rate. And within the, the next 30 seconds, um, you should have um, started respiratory support if that is needed, and also put on a pulse oximeter if that is available. Now, is it realistic to do this during the golden minute? There are several studies showing that this is challenging. And we recently published a, a very brief overview of some studies, uh, two from Tanzania, <clears throat> one from Uganda, one from Nepal, and to see when the first ventilation with bag and mask was started. And you see this study here from Tanzania, they started after, in mean, after 134 seconds, very late. But this from Uganda after 68 seconds and, and Nepal 71 seconds. And again from Tanzania, 109 seconds. This shows that it is possible to, to really start the first uh, ventilation approximately within the first golden, first minute, the golden minute, uh, but it is a challenge. Now, of course, there are a number of factors that influence uh, the golden minute, and we have tried to summarize some of these here in this slide, which was on this figure, which was we published in uh, two, three years ago now, a summary of, of uh, delivery room handling, and you can see the, the reference here in Journal of Perinatal Medicine. So there are a number of factors, antenatal factors or factors during delivery, which affects the outcome. For instance, your amnionides, mode of delivery, antenatal steroids or not, preeclampsia, maternal BMI or maternal nutrition. And then we have a number of variables we can play with in the delivery room, and we have listed some of them here. Tidal volume, flow rate, oxygen, cord clamping, PEEP, surfactant, temperature control, and so forth. And we also published some of the risk factors associated with the need for recitation in the delivery room. And I will not go through these in details here, but as you all know, there are maternal factors, and they are listed here, fetal factors and perinatal factors. And it's also possible to identify risk factors associated with intubation rates. And again, we have here the maternal factors, fetal factors and perinatal factors. Now, I'll talk a little bit about some of these factors. And I'm gonna start with the, the maternal BMI. In 2014, eight years ago now, we published this um, study in, uh, in Yama uh, showing that there is an almost a linear relation between maternal BMI 
BMI at the beginning of the pregnancy and infant or per, here is perinatal mortality. We found this exactly the same relation with the infant mortality and neonatal mortality. You see that increases with maternal BMI. We have um, now continued with this work and we have now from almost 24 million singleton births, we have constructed this curve and this, these data are uh, have not been published yet. So um, uh, they're not for, it's just for, for, for private use in this conference now. But what you see here is that there's a U-shaped curve and this is for infant mortality. And it seems that uh, that the minimal, the lowest mortality is when the mother has a BMI between let's say 18.5 and, and up to 25. And then you see it increases like this. And we have looked at different mortalities, not only infant mortality, but neonatal mortality, early neonatal mortality, late neonatal mortality and post neonatal mortality. And we find the same pattern as you see here. And also regarding maternal age, we find this U-shaped curve and also for different races as you can see here. So one message to, to young girls or young women um, is that they should try to keep their BMI uh, around 20, 25 uh, before they get pregnant. What about the use of antenatal steroids? Well, <clears throat> together with Dominic Omo and Nina Modi, um, uh, we published a couple of years ago a study of almost or more than 38,000 babies born in Europe between 2014 and 2016 with gestational age between 22 and 32 weeks. And what we found <clears throat> in this um, e-newborn <clears throat> database was that <clears throat> babies who had received a complete uh, course of antenatal steroids had a reduced mortality as expected, but even those who had a, an incomplete course had a significantly reduced. So the message is that even if you are not able to finish a complete uh, course, you should start uh, when there's threatened premature labor. <clears throat> what about the mode of delivery? Well, this is um, a figure published by Yi and Kovark some years ago. It shows that mortality, neonatal mortality decreases until C-section rate is approximately 10 percentage, and then it, it is stable. So from this, this data, we conclude that maybe the optimal C-section rate regarding mortality is between 10 and 20 percentage. And I mentioned this because as you all know, the C-section rate is much higher than 20% in many places in the world. I guess also many places in India. And this is important also regarding morbidity. And this shows that serious respiratory morbidity is significantly higher after C-section here for 37 weeks. Um, you see vaginal deliveries, the, the black boxes. Even up to 39 weeks, there's a higher morbidity after C-section. So this is another message that C-section increases morbidity and it should be kept, um, should not exceed 20%, perhaps. So what is the need of recitation for small babies? Uh, and again, <clears throat> the data from the e-newborn database, um, the European database on babies between 22 and 32 weeks of gestation. And here we can see that um, <clears throat> for the most immature babies, almost all of them would need recitation. 
but you see that the rate decreases and it's less than 60 percent at 32 weeks. However, when you talk about basic recitation, which is defined as the use of bag and mask plus oxygen, if needed, you see that very few of the immature babies would need that. And it reaches a maximum around 30 weeks and then it drops a little bit to 32 weeks. By contrast, advanced recitation, <clears throat> which means the use of bag and mask, oxygen, intubation, chest compressions, and or adrenaline, if that is needed, you see that most of the immature babies, they would need advanced recitation and the rate drops very uh, significant and rapidly towards 32 weeks. Well, does it matter whether it's basic or, or advanced recitation? Yes, uh, we have found that the risk of death is increased approximately twofold if a baby needs advanced recitation um, compared to basic recitation. Now, very recently, um, the Union of European Neonatal and Perinatal Societies, UNPS, they published a um, survey of the living room handling in Europe. And here you see a map of, of Europe and you see the black countries here, they contributed a lot and others less. And you see that um, in this survey, more than 400 units um, replied. You see that mo many of these, most of them are from Turkey, Italy, and to some degree, Spain, it means that the results, uh, <clears throat> the data from this survey <clears throat> comes predominantly from these countries. But we also have some replies from France and Germany, UK, and to some extent from, from um, Scandinavia. And I don't have time to go through this, all these data with you. I just want to, to focus on this survey for those who are interested. But if you look at umbilical cord management after term vaginal delivery, more than 60% of, of these units, they practice delayed cord clamping more than 30 seconds after birth and 23% so-called physiological cord clamping. I'll come back to that. 7% only immediate cord clamping and 5% cord milking. After C-section, delayed cord clamping is practiced in approximately 50% and physiological cord clamping in 30%. And still 25% um, are clamped immediately after C elective C-section. Terminal management, I will not go through that, but just mention a few words about heart rate assessment. Because as you know, ILCOR in 2015, they suggested that heart rate should be assessed by ECG, and they didn't mention stethoscopy anymore. So what is the situation in, in Europe, according to this survey? 78% use stethoscope for heart rate assessment. 32% can use ECG and 24%, I was surprised about this high number, still use umbilical cord palpation. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so this, um, I'm not spend more time on this because there's a lot of data in this uh, survey uh, and you, you can find the publication here in neonatology this year, early this um, spring. Uh, well, you can find the level of CPAP, level of PEEP, um, initial peak inspiratory pressure, use of sustaining lung inflation in, in these European countries. And for instance, uh, uh, talk about sustained lung inflation, 61% never use it, but there's some units are using sustained inflation 16 percentage occasionally and 11 percentage routinely. And I, I was surprised when I saw this uh, data. So <clears throat> to talk more about heart rate assessment at birth, um, I mentioned that um, ILCOR in 2015 suggested that heart rate should be assessed by ECG. And uh, the reason for that is that 
heart rate by auscultation has been shown to be inaccurate and it underestimates the heart rate obtained by ECG. But to compensate for that, <clears throat> together with Richard Soule, uh, Roger Soule, um, we suggested that instead of counting six seconds, we should count 10 seconds. Um, and maybe some of this inaccuracy could be eliminated. We know that a reliable heart rate is obtained earlier with ECG than with pulse oximetry. In one study, it was 84 seconds difference. On the other hand, many of the ECG signals are excluded due to technical problems. Uh, and in one study, up to 40%, which is a high number. And we also have a number of so-called pulseless electrical activity. And animal models have shown up to 50% could be that. Um, so, also, ECG has some drawbacks, but we know that new devices are under development. And very recently, Kateria, he and his colleagues, they published uh, a new study showing that uh, ECG with new techniques, technology is, um, is very efficient. But in 2016, Roger Sol and I, we stated that auscultation is still the gold standard for assessing heart rate at birth. I would like to hear your opinion about this. And then a few words about the delayed cord clamping. I think all the big societies today, they recommend delayed cord clamping, uh, at least for um, preterm infants. For instance, WHO, they state that in newly born term or preterm babies, who do not require positive pressure ventilation, the cord should not be clamped earlier than one minute after birth. And the reason they say one minute is that we know that after 60 seconds, approximately 70 percentage of the blood volume transfused from the placenta to the baby has reached the baby. And it's not so much to gain if we wait another minute, it's from 70 percentage to 80 percent something. So I think that's the reason for the cutoff of, of one minute. But of course, now we have also been familiar with the term physiological cord clamping, means that you should start ventilation before you cut the cord. And the reason for that, this is based on several studies, but maybe most of all from an experimental study from Stuart Hooper's lab in Melbourne, Australia. And what you see here is that here we have the arterial pressure. And if you clamp the core, cord before you start ventilation, you see that the arterial pressure increases quite abruptly. And also carotid arterial blood flow increases. By contrast, if you start ventilating and then clamp the cord, you have this more smooth transition, uh, both in arterial blood pressure and in uh, carotid blood flow. Are there any risks of delayed cord clamping as overtransfusion, symptomatic polycythemia, jaundice, hypothermia, persistent pulmonary hypertension, delayed resuscitation? Well, Bruckner and co-workers, they answered these questions um, recently, and they suggest that delayed cord clamping in healthy term infants for at least 60 seconds in high income environments and for at least 180 seconds in limited resource environments. And they claim that delayed cord clamping reduces incidence of anemia and iron deficiency. And I think that has been um, very well documented. It improves hemodynamic uh, parameters. And there is no evidence that delayed cord clamping results in high rates of phototherapy. Now, what about the growth retarded and monochorionic twins? Well, they say that more evidence is needed. Very recently, there was a Zoom meeting um, about this matter with uh, Kateria, Ola Andersson, and Arendt Pass. And I brought up this question about monohuronic twins. And they said that, yes, today they practice delayed cord clamping also for monohuronic twins. And I think it is important to be aware that if you practice delayed core clamping, 
oxygenation, the oxygenation pattern is different from if you practice early cold clamping. So this is uh, illustrated here. This is in a paper by Sankaran and Laksh I mean, Rushima and myself, which is in press, I think. I think it's not been published yet. And here we have the situation here to the left in the fetal life. And you see if we have early cord clamping, cardiac output is decreased, and there is an increased risk for interventricular hemorrhage. You see that the oxygen saturation is slower, uh, it increases slower than if you practice delayed or deferred cord clamping as seen here. The cardiac, cardiac output is higher and there's less interventricular hemorrhage and oxygen saturation increases faster. And this is demonstrated here in this slide here. So here we have the fetal situation to the, to the left here. And if you go up, it's what happened if you defer cord clamping or down here, immediate cord clamping. And what you see that is that the oxygen saturation increases slower. It starts slower and it increases slower if you practice immediate cord clamping. And I think this is very important. This, the upper blue line here is, there are data from Max Vento's study and, and the black line is from Dawson's curve. And, and, um, and you see that we probably need new nomograms uh, after we have started practicing delayed cord clamping. Just one warning about cord milking. This is from Carteria's work. And what he showed was that there is a fourfold increase in severe interventricular hemorrhage if you practice cord milking in immature babies. You see here the, the, the risk of severe interventricular hemorrhage um, after cord milking in the black bars versus delayed cord clamping, the gray bar bars. So why does this happen? Well, uh, if you milk the cord, um, we have an, we, you get a, an increased venous return to the right atrium. And this enters, of course, the foramen ovale and aorta and um, Due to lack of cerebral autoregulation, the right to left ductal shunt, this results in fluctuations in flow to an immature brain with fragile germinal matrix, and this may trigger interventricular hemorrhage. So this is maybe one way to illustrate that. A few words about chest compressions and um, use of adrenaline and what um, Laksimin Rushima and his group has shown in animal. Um, do you hear me? I see that my connection is unstable. Do you hear me clearly? You're okay now. You're okay now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So what they found in animal studies was that even if they used the recommended dosage of epinephrine or adrenaline, 0.03 milligram per kilo, it's the flush volume which is of importance. So if you flush the epinephrine with only one milliliter, you achieve the... Um, um, uh, you achieve a spontaneous uh, uh, heart rate at first dose in 43 percentage. If you flush with 3 ml per kilo, you get a double um, reestablishment of, of uh, circulation in 89 percentage. So I think this is an important clinical detail that you should flush with a higher volume than previously uh, applied 3 ml. Uh, instead of one ml. And what about oxygenation during chest compressions? Which FO2 should be applied during chest compressions? And should FO2 be weaned rapidly or gradually when um, reestablishment of uh, circulation is achieved? Well, the American guidelines, NRP, they 
they state that it may be reasonable to increase inspired oxygen to 100% if there was no response to positive pressure ventilation with lower concentrations. And I, I support that uh, statement. However, they also state that once return of spontaneous circulation is achieved, the supplemental oxygen concentration may be decreased to target a physiological level based on pulse oximetry to reduce the risks associated with hyperoxia. Well, I'm not sure this late last statement is the optimal one because, again, if we go to Lakshman Rushima's group in Davis in US, what they found in, in newborn lamb and a newborn lamb <coughs> model was that when <coughs> they weaned the FO2 abruptly to air adjusted based on oxygen saturation, you prevented the surge of in PO2 and it minimized the oxidative stress compared to a gradual weaning from 100% oxygen. And here we have the data and you see the the red squares here are from animals. And here we have the cerebral oxygen delivery on <coughs> the y-axis. <coughs> and you see that if you wean gradually the red squares here, you overshoot this gray area, which is the, the recommended area you should aim at, the target at. You see it takes more than 15 minutes before you reach the target. By contrast, if you, you wean directly to air, you see that you're within this target within one minute. So I think that there's many reasons for doing that. So reducing FO2 to, to air immediately. And then a few words about um, um, thermal control, heat loss prevention, and you all know that uh, you should place or cover infants with an occlusive wrap immediately after birth if it's immature. And this will reduce <coughs> the incidence of hypothermia and result in decreased morbidity and mor mortality, hopefully. But <coughs> unfortunately, it's not like that. This is from a, a Cochrane review some years ago, four years ago, show that there was absolute no difference in, in major brain injury, whether you, you put this baby, wrap them into plastic or not, and there was no difference in mortality. Still, we think that it is important to keep these babies uh, thermal neutral, and I would still recommend to wrap them into plastic, but we have to know that um, it might not um, influence morbidity or mortality. By contrast, uh, early kangaroo mother care is important. This uh, study, which I'm sure all of you know, which was also taken, um, uh, Indian uh, units took also part in this. Uh, <clears throat> babies between one and 1.8 kilos, uh, kangaroo mother care immediate, showed that they could lower mortality um, and also was good for early initiation of breastfeeding. I have to add, though, that the first time I visited the Maulana Asset Medical College in Delhi in, in 1991, I think um, they practiced early kangaroo mother care already at that time, maybe without knowing it. <clears throat> and then I will end up with a few words about uh, the HELIX trial because I would like to discuss it with you and hear your opinion about it. And <clears throat> uh, the HELIX trial was a study, as you know, uh, where low to moderate uh, babies above 36 weeks, more than 1.8 kilos, were treated with hypothermia. And you can see from here that uh, in this study, they were very successful in separating the control and the hypothermia uh, groups. Uh, you see the hypothermia babies, they, they got a temperature of, of 33.5, which was the target. 
But when they looked at the outcome, as you know, the secondary outcome, which was death up to until 18 months, this found that there was a higher mortality in hypothermia <coughs> arm. And the relative risk was the risk ratio was 1.35, 42 versus 31 percent. Um, and of course, and here is the Kaplan Meyer plot showing that babies treated with hypothermia they die earlier, faster, and and some higher mortality than those who did not get hypothermia therapy. And of course, this created a lot of discussion. And for instance, this uh, uh, review article here, rise and fall of therapeutic hypothermia in low resource settings, lesson from the Helix trial. And the authors stated that generation of high quality research data alone are not sufficient. It is important that low and middle income countries, clin clinicians have the necessary skills to interpret these data and use it in their clinical practice without being influenced by industry lobbying or stakeholders with vested interest. So <clears throat> this is a meta-analysis of all the <clears throat> data <clears throat> in low income countries of cooling before the HELIX trial. And, and here you can see that there was an effect of, of, of cooling. So <clears throat> I would like to hear your opinion about that. So just to summarize uh, very briefly, we, we published last year <clears throat> a study about delivery management of asphyxiated term and near-term infants. And here we put a list of issues, variables, as cord clamping, basic steps of neonatal recitation, heart rate assessment, et cetera, et cetera. And um, <clears throat> we try to distinguish between low resources and high resources. So in low resources, we recommend delayed cord clamping and high resources, uh, immediate cord clamping to initiate recitation measures. I'm not sure I agree with this uh, um, conclusion today, but this is how we put it uh, then one year ago. And so for those who are interested, you can read this um, um, and find, um, see if you find anything of interest. And here are some <clears throat> references to, to the data I have shown you today, for those who are interested. And with this, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sotstein. Uh, I don't think I need to elaborate till so as the privilege of the chair, I'll save some of my personal questions to the end. <clears throat> I'll, I would like to uh, open this to the audience and if there are any queries, please pass it over and we can ask because there have been many elegant points that he has dealt with. And uh, if there are any queries, kindly come up with them. If I recollect correctly, sir, you had asked for the first comment from the house about auscultation instead of ECG monitoring. What yeah. is our opinion about this to determine the heart rate of a newborn baby in the delivery room? Uh, how many of you would be using ECG monitoring here? Could you please raise your hands? How many of you would be auscultating the babies here? I guess uh, it's unanimous. Uh, everybody here prefers auscultating. I personally yeah. feel uh, if I could comment, long time back, people came up with mandatory <coughs> to do pulse oximetry saturation as soon as a baby is born. And yeah. we even specified the company from which the pulse oximeter should be obtained. And now suddenly that has come out of work and I can assure you there've been a lot of money spent on that. I'm sure yeah. some monitoring will come up where some leads will stick very easily on the chest and there'll be some company coming out with that also. And mm. if it's recommended as a standard of care, uh, I guess uh, some people will be spending a lot of money to come up to the mark and come back to your basics about air instead of oxygen. We'll also land up finally saying auscultation is the best, sir. Do you think we go with you? A more yeah. Practical <clears throat> uh, yeah, thank you. I, because I think it's important. I, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't forget to, to do auscultation. And I think it should be the basic uh, still. 
even if we get more sophisticated uh, uh, equipment. The other comment I wanted to say was physiological cord clamping. Uh, a very good study has been done in India also by Dr. Mangal Bharati and team from Chennai in which they utilize this and I think they have come up with very good data in that. Uh, it's unfortunate that we are not able to give it much more international uh, exposure to that pattern. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry for that. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry for that, yeah. Your last one is a favorite one for this house that is Helix, Helix mm. trial. Yeah. Uh, well, I have my personal opinion, but is there anybody here who would like to make comments? Uh, welcome. I don't know why, why everybody is very diplomatic, which I am not. Uh, <laughs> it has been a best, one of the best rebuttals to this has been published in the Indian Journal of Pediatrics, I think in the previous edition of this year, uh, by Professor Bhatt and Adisheshan from the Pondicherry group. And I agree with uh, send person, in fact, I have some more uh, objections to what has been said there, because while a study can be made statistically perfect, the fundamental error of sampling is there. When a sampling center is tested, it should always be tested in centers where mortality is otherwise the lowest. Because if you take it from centers where mortality due to many reasons is even otherwise high, uh, your data will be so skewed Mm -hmm. that you will not know what is a contributory factor for this. There are very good centers in India uh, which can at any day uh, compete with any of the Western centers where they're doing cooling. And perhaps some of us felt that the centers chosen were based mainly on the MRI specificity of the center. Like, do you have the appropriate MRI scan available rather than do you have the type of facility? It is not just level three care. Do you have the one is to one nursing facility available? It is not just equipment. Most of the centers were government centers where we know that we are so flooded with patients and we can't turn away patients <coughs> in India. So the choice of center is something which we felt was absolutely unjustified. It is also, I feel, extremely cruel to say that people had vested interests and industrial interests in this matter where all of us know that the study work done with a Mira blanket that was done from Velo was totally free, honorary, and there is no incentives in that. And even WHO has said that it is one of the best uh, you know, innovations that has been done. So certain comments should definitely have been avoided. And this is far, far from being a recommendation. I feel perhaps this study could be also not told as from low and middle income countries because most of the uh, centers were from India. And with a few uh, samples taken from one or two countries around the place, we are forgetting mm. that this small group does not make entire low and middle income countries of the world. So mm. I think it is an authentication of a study in this matter is something I feel publishing houses should refrain from making it in future. Because a lot of people still do continue cooling. Many people swear by it, but the center has to be good for it. And when yeah. the center is good, the results are good. So I don't mm. think we should paint everything in this brush. That's my personal opinion and not as the chair of the session and as usual and the least diplomatic of the group. I stand by my words. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, I was very interested to hear this. Uh, um, and um, <clears throat> if I understand you correctly, you still think that uh, you should cool these babies uh, provided you have uh, uh, the correct environment, you have the correct uh, settings. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Very valuable comment. Dr. Arun is from New Zealand. He is one of our visiting faculty this year. <laughs> yeah. Come on. And, and also a friend of Sabine as well as uh, uh, Sita. Um, to be uh, on their defense, you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't cool. In, in fact, I was one of the first to criticize them. I sent a e personal email to them and said, no, this is not the right way to really even project these sort of things. And as you very rightly did that um, meta-analysis, you showed the meta-analysis that the benefit even in low and middle uh, income countries is far exceeds the <coughs> thing that um, Helix trial has shown. We didn't go by just one study with you for making a standard recommendation. I think we should go by, as we always have been saying in this whole evidence-based uh, 
situation that it is a systematic reviews and meta-analysis which should be the standard evidence-based rather than just one study or there is this has shown that there has to be caution really as uh, the chair has already suggested that unless you have a center with all the facilities which is already outlined uh, there is no reason not to uh, you know, it is unfair, and I have I brought this to their attention as well. I said, if you if you think the population that you're dealing with is absolutely different from the population in the Western world, why don't you do uh, individual patient meta-analysis of those children from Asian countries who are born in the Western countries, from all the studies that we have <coughs> done, and, and see if there is a difference? Mm. They haven't responded to me for that. Okay. Sorry, this was a long-winded uh, comment, but I yeah. think we should be doing it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate your comment. I'm very Larison from Chennai. So, <coughs> in my opinion, the basic uh, reason why hypothermia did not work in this setting is because of inadequate intensive care. So, when you look at the type of intensive care which these babies in the, all the centers they are giving. As Chair has pointed out, there is inadequate nursing care. And there are several other issues in the intensive care. So in pulmonary hypertension, in them was diagnosed based on clinical saturation. So this is not how we do in higher income countries. Several mm. other issues. So basically this inadequate intensive care which is causing the problem was causing a problem. So in, a ba in babies who are already sick, you are administering a therapy with <coughs> hypothermia, which is going to destabilize. Those babies are going to deteriorate. So that's the main reason, in my opinion, why this baby didn't do well. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I know that Chennai was one of the centers participating. Thank you. Oh, any other comments, please? very useful comments were made. Uh, first of all, uh, I really enjoyed the one about the adrenaline in which just increase the volume, which is something very practical uh, for all of us can uh, practice. And uh, overall, one graph of yours, Professor Ola, was a bit confusing for me, in which you said that the cesarean sections, uh, the infant mortality rate would be the lowest if it is around, should not be more than 20%. Uh, but Somehow the graph, when it went below 10%, seemed to rise. Now, that was a bit confusing. Does it mean that if you don't do cesarean sections and if it goes well below 10%, you may still well, have a higher mortality? I think the mortality was, uh, kind of, uh, according to this study by Yi, it, it was uh, kind of stable after 10 percentage. So, but I think uh, before we draw conclusions, we have to add morbidity also. And of course, that c-section will reduce some morbidities but it also may increase some morbidities so it's a balance and that's why i i said my best guess is that uh, see the, the optimal c-section rate should be not higher than 20 percentage but it's 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 a, i think it's a, it's an educated guess only can it be lesser because your graph went up could be less. and it is less let's say could be less. Person, yeah it could be less we have found that uh, sort of anathema for C-sections has been giving rise to a lot of things like herbs palsy in our experience, where yeah. there is so much push of not doing cesarean sections that you land up with babies with an herbs, uh, yeah. which is quite uh, worrying. Yeah. So this is also something which we are really concerned about. Yeah. So what do you think would be the um, optimal C-section rate? I mean, in Norway, we try to keep it uh, around 20, not about 20%. No, 20 is fine, 20 is fine, but I think each obstetrician is trying to outdo the other by reducing the C-sections further. Yeah. But I think it's a concern in many, many places in the world. C-section rate above 50 percentage. And we, as neonatologists, we have to say, tell our colleagues uh, and also the, the mothers that this is not optimal. I think uh, we have had an elaborate discussion and Manoj would like to personally thank you for coming on. I'll hand over the mic to Manoj. Oh. Professor Ola, thank you so much, sir. 
is a honor to have you here for the second anniversary of our sessions which we began with you if you remember uh, yeah. two years ago we inaugurated the learn from the legend session with the ox uh, the talk on oxygenation of newborn it was a i mean uh, we were the uh, chartering in unknown uh, waters at the time but then now you are so thankful to you only thing we are missing your physical presence here uh, uh, there is something you know because of the uh, continuous postponement anyway we hope to have you here in kerala in the near future thank you so much manu i thank you for these kind words and i really hope and look forward to to visit you in kerala soon thank you sir thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you so much thank you all thank you divaga sir